So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're starting over the next 30 seconds. Countdown is starting now. And uh, and Harry here will be playing a video from Diving to You. And we'll take it from there. Thank you. And we've been talking with some of you this morning saying how amazing diving is because first and foremost, it connects people no matter what the hierarchy level is, where they come from, any sort of um, discussion about filling the box and see whether you qualify or whether you have to make a case with your management is out of the window. So it's really, truly accessible and inclusive to everybody. Um, hopefully with the reverse mentoring and the facilitation, I didn't even know myself. I mean, with just me paying attention for us to the video, uh, things will be progressing even more. Um, without further ado, and apologies for turning my back at people, I don't know, online even, um, on this note, thanks to everybody here, as well as the people online uh, participating, and there will be participation, active participation soon enough. Just bear with us for the first 30 minutes. Don't drop that. Don't fall asleep. Just woken up, hopefully, and um, we'll show you the goods, right? I guess. Um, okay, so the agenda, and with a request that I get pants if I don't sort of um, talk about the breakout rooms by 9.30. You, you said yes to that. Um, starting now, Ish, I'm starting with a little introduction as to what the topic means and what is the ramifications or indeed the benefits of neurodivergence in the workplace, but also beyond in the society. Um, we'll be introducing Amy and Darren. Tea, 20 minutes. Um, breakout rooms. We will have our own breakout room. So probably, you know, sort of come to a very quick sort of end of the chase. Um, that side of the room will be with me in one of the rooms over there. We'll be leading each other to it, hopefully. Middle sort of side of the room, so that middle side remains here. This side of the room goes with Darren, right? Over onto another room. Again, we'll be led by Darren, so everything fine. We won't be losing our navigation, although some of us do tend to do that. Um, so that will be the breakout rooms. We have 20 minutes to explore specific topics. It's allocated one of them, three core topics. And we will come back with a feedback and summary of the key takeaways, steps for action, and any conclusions. The will, as I understand, and thanks to the amazing host, uh, Maurice uh, RMS will be the chance of um, a short networking session for about 30 minutes afterwards. But by all means, reach out to any of us, reach out to each other, uh, and keep on the discussion happening. As we said, again, with many of you earlier, and no doubt we'll continue 
the dialogue, this is not about a one-off, an annual event like the World Day of X. We are trying to live through it because at the end of the day, if you decide to live in an accessible and accessibility sort of nurturing way, this better happen on a daily basis rather than once a year. Um, yeah, and we are planning to finish the 10. So I've already sort of almost exhausted my 10 minutes. <laughs> Um, learning objectives as a true presentation style. Um, one is to understand the challenges and the opportunities that neurodivergence has in the space of not just our industry, but also in terms of innovation. And what does innovation mean in the space? Why do we like innovation? Um, start the conversations, first and foremost, by reflecting yourselves, taking, giving yourselves the time, taking the opportunity to appreciate the topic, to understand what it means for you, what it means to the people you know, to your family, to your friends, to some of your colleagues. Perhaps join up the dots and kind of go, aha moment, this person reminds me of this, what Amy will be actually speaking about, now I get them slightly better. You know, leave this room with a little bit more appreciation and capacity to, to show more tolerance or respectful curiosity. It's, it's, it, it, don't assume ask is the key sort of message. And lastly, <laughs> identify the tangible and practical solutions to common accessibility related to workplace issues. Here we're speaking about adaptive, my favorite new word, adaptive or assistive, in other words, technology. Um, things that I'm taking spiel. I don't even know what the script is, but um, some of them technologies actually don't even cost anything. Um, some of them technologies cost next to nothing. And there's always a journey of progressively, incrementally building on an improvement. So that's me, not in the middle. This is a pixel sort of robot of me. I think better photos on the right and left hand side. <laughs> Those who do on the right and left, not me. Um, but before I speak more about this person, through this person, slightly different color of hair, but uh, not much sense, so the difference, I guess, still speaks a lot. Um, thank you to, as I said, um, Moody's uh, RMS for having us today. Thank you also to the organizing, facilitating people represented um, through organizations such as TMK, QB, Liberty, Kennedy's, uh, AIG Life, Gallagher, Axis Travelers, Chap, and Lois. Photographer Luke. <laughs> um, has to happen. I, I always look very serious in photos. Um, and of course, Adjust Services and Text Help um, that we'll be hearing more of uh, in a few minutes. I'm an economist and I'm a behavioral economist, and guess what that means? It means that if anything, we like breaking down biases. And when it comes to accessibility, it's a bias sort of topic. And as uh, Professor Tala, a uh, Nobel laureate um, who I listened to last night at the Chicago Booth University said, there's a strong economic case for diversity in the workplace. I hear you, Professor Tala, and it's great that I call him a colleague, although I don't have a Nobel yet. <laughs> um, that also means that I love statistics and data. And for those of you whose bosses really, really expect data before they can sign up to a membership uh, for one communities such as GAIN, I resent GAIN, by the way. Um, I'm a supervisory board member at GAIN, acronym, you're the veteran people don't like acronyms. So that means Group for Autism, Insurance, Investment, and Neurodiversity. We are startup uh, slash um, as I said, community interest group whose mission is to spark a very radical improvement in the employment opportunities for neurodiverse people in our industry. Now, whether they are ready in our industry and they know by self-diagnosis or formal diagnosis or they're outside our industry, they want to come in, but they don't quite know how appreciated, understood and accepted they will be, we are there to facilitate when not for profit, as I said, we are a social enterprise. Uh, but what we want is any of the funds we receive from our corporate members to be injected back into the system to promote through events, activities, and really measurable, well, again, action plans, closing the say do gap, essentially, is what we're trying to do. Eventually drive ourselves out of business because we've sorted everything out and there's nothing more to fight for. So help us in the fight. Um, what I want to say, I did say that as an economist, I've got some 
statistics. And that's almost the last thing I'll be saying today. OMA statistics, um, survey titled Outcomes for Disabled People in the UK, uh, back in 2020, 23 years ago. Autistic people in employment, 20% is the 80-20 paradigm, for those of you who play about that. So 20% are in employment, and the remaining 8% not employed. So I repeat, out of the 100% pie of people who are in the workforce, okay? Um, the vulnerability experiences study, uh, short for VEQ, in case any of you have shared of back in 2019, I was signed off from work for at least two months due to mental health, said 43% of people questioned who are on the autism spectrum, compared to 15% from everybody else, saying so-called neurotypical. We'll come to the definitions in a second. So just autism spectrum is something that we should all be somewhat familiar with. I spent at least a year, at least a year, unemployed and seeking work. 48% of those people on the autism spectrum compared to the 15% of everybody else. I was sacked, <coughs> dismissed, if you were a better word, I guess, from a job. 42% autism versus 24% everybody else. I left the job because I was unable to deal with the work environment or demands. A massive 73% people on the autism spectrum compared to 32%, which is also massive. So again, we're speaking in universal design because we want to look after everybody. But obviously, statistics do speak for themselves. And lastly, I left the job because I was being treated badly by colleagues. 49% people on the autism spectrum compared to the 19% otherwise. They're quite striking. And essentially the reason why we are speaking with you today, um, and rather than featuring neurodivergence in the title, we chose to speak about accessibility and innovation. Um, before I pass on to, to Amy, uh, one last thing. McKinsey's story coined the term, the world for talent back in 1980s. I should have known that, but I'm of this age. And we still talk about untapped or massively underutilized talent, 1980s. Now, we should know better. We're speaking about all these great sort of enhancements given by technologies, and yet our most important factor, which is human capital, is being either underutilized or really untapped in the aspect of difference. So it's an accessibility case, an accessibility case that if we enable this kind of polymorphy, I also speak Greek, um, th th this polymorphy of people to sort of infiltrate the system, then it's almost guaranteed that innovation doesn't sue. Innovation shouldn't be about the next best policy because we all know insurance is not rocket science at all, really. It's <laughs> massively you know, right? I mean, I'm happy to take the argument forward, but that's another sort of a workshop you have to tolerate me for. Um, but innovation is really by expanding, you know, these layers of the onion, whereby our knowledge, our appreciation, are going to sort of scratch the surface of certain topics, keeps on expanding and keeps on giving and keeps on helping us become very humans as well as professionals in the space. Thank you very much for 14 minutes, but we started late, it was a video. <laughs> that was really took up four whole minutes. Um, anyway, let me see, let me see, by the way, before I... Yes, it is Amy. Next. Oh, great, yes, great. yes, 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 yes. Great, 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 great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rina. So welcome, everybody, and thank you so much. Um, like I said, my name is Amy. Um, I'm one of the neurodiversity consultants at Adjust. I'll tell you a little bit, about, a little bit about myself. So my training, I am a speech language therapist, so I work in the NHS specialising in autism diagnostics, but on a personal level as well. Um, I'm neurodivergent, I'm an ADHD, and a little, a little while ago, I think, you know what, let's pull together that professional, personal experience, 
to be honest, I love the sound of my own voice, and put that <laughs> into doing trainings, um, working with Just Services to create spaces where not only can neurodivergent people sort of suffer through, get by, survive the day, but where people can really thrive, where people can have spaces to really flourish to their full potential. So we've talked a little bit about neurodiversity, but we've not actually told you about what that means. Yes, so basically, neurodiversity is a term coined back in the 1990s and essentially says that we recognise, value and celebrate, but we all think in incredibly different ways. Across my career, I've seen this used as an umbrella term for a variety of different neurodiverse conditions, which we're now starting to refer to more so as neurotypes, these different kinds of minds. These things include, but are definitely not limited to, things like autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, epilepsy, Tourette's, all of these things fit under the neurodiversity umbrella. And when we're thinking about neurodiversity, I often really like to um, pull parallels to biodiversity, the idea that if we're looking at our ecosystems, we have various different uh, organisms that do incredibly different things that need incredibly different things, but are all essential and equal within that ecosystem. So if you took a cactus, you took it from the desert somewhere, where my cactuses grew, and you plonked it into my back garden, sorry, in the Birmingham, <laughs> as it pop against things. Um, it might just about survive, it might, might look a bit sad, you're definitely not going to see it thrive. But what we would never do is say that that cactus was wrong or disordered. What we would do is we would think, how can we let this cactus thrive to its full potential? Maybe we get some particular fertilizer, maybe we pop it in a greenhouse. And that, I'm not advocating you put all the neurodiverse employees in greenhouse, <laughs> but what I'm saying is sometimes we need to change the environment. And not only then do you see that cactus survive and get through the day, you see it start to thrive, you see it start to offer things that really don't grow naturally in my back garden in Birmingham. And that's, and that's neuroinclusion. It's creating spaces in which everybody, no matter their neurotype, can thrive to their full potential. So like everybody, neurodivergent people all have their individual strengths and some of the barriers that they might find in the workplace. I'm going to go through some of the key ones that we might want to consider. So the first one we're going to look at is communication. I mean, communication is massive. I mean, I'm a speech therapist. That's literally what I do. If it was a small job, I wouldn't have a job. But if we're thinking about communication, we might look at for dyslexic people. We know the, um, the key area of difference often is really often advanced verbal communication skills. And it's that disconnect between sometimes um, more of a challenge with written communication. If we're thinking about our autistic populations, often by the time we hit the workplace, what can be perceived as challenges in communication more accurately looks like the disconnect between what does autistic communication look like and what are the expectations of non-autistic people. It's almost like sort of different cultures that people just communicate in very different ways and if we can both learn to think about how that other person is seeing things from both sides we can work in a way if we think about problem solving this is a real common strength across the different areas because if everybody else is looking at a problem and stepping from a to b going through the same thought processes to solve this particular problem actually sometimes you need someone coming from an incredibly different Perspective with a bit of lateral thinking, walking maybe from Q to R to and solve that in a new way. If we look at actually physiospatial skills, so um, having a conversation with my brother, so my brother is dyslexic, he's also an architect, and in his firm, there are lots and lots of dyslexic people, and we only actually re realize this when he went and have that conversation because no one ever says, Oh, you're dyslexic, I wonder if you've made a fantastic architect. People don't have that conversation. But we know now that GCHQ are actively recruiting um, dyslexic or autistic people as well because of those real strengths in spatial skills and pattern recognition. We know that hyperfocus can be a real key strength for neurodiverse people, especially ADHDers. Um, I like to describe my hyperfocus a lot of the time as running on a 60 mile an hour treadmill. And when I'm on the treadmill, Fantastic things happen. I can do 10 hours of work in two hours. Life is sweet. But with that understanding that I can't do that for an entire working day, I do two hours of that, I come off and I'm exhausted. And the concept of getting back on the treadmill can be a little bit overwhelming. 
we know that definitely causes of base stress for a lot of neurodiverse people within the workplace, things like sensory needs. So looking at say the five senses that you know about at school, but also three more. So we have our proprioception, which is the understanding of where your body is in space. So that's how I can close my eyes, so close my eyes, touch my nose and pull it away again. I can do that because I've got proprioception. Your vestibular sense, which is a sense of balance and movement, and your interoception as well, those feelings inside your body, knowing that you're in pain and you need the toilet, those kind of things. And people can be over or underreactive to those senses. And if they're managing that element, that can take up a huge amount of um, mental effort and mental space. Um, things like managing change, knowing that if those big changes, your office moves and things like that can be really um, unsettling, but also there's little changes as well. There's little things that might to other people seem a bit or a bit insignificant, but actually these things can cause big stress. And if we're having to manage all of those things, there isn't a much room left to innovate, to change, um, and to do exciting things. And working memory. So my incredibly scientific way of describing the working memory is that it's not your long-term memory, it's not your short-term memory, it's your short, short-term memory. It's, for me, getting off the uh, tube station today, asking someone, where on earth is Moody's? And they say, OK, go over the bridge, and when you see that cost, you turn right, and I go, Yes, that's fantastic. I, I, I got bricks, and then I'll ask somebody else. But that's a quite, maybe quite silly example. But actually, in the workplace, that looks like your boss giving you an instruction, and by the time you got back to your desk. Well, actually, I forgot there was anything to remember because someone called me to ask me about the weekend. I got a cup of tea. So thinking about working memory, thinking about ways to support people and ensure that actually we give people the best chance to be able to follow these things through. So what do we do about this? How do we access these wonderful parts of neurodiverse minds? For one thing, we can't cherry pick. We can't say, right, I want these amazing, fantastic parts of neurodiverse minds because we have people. People don't work like that. To get those fantastic parts of neurodiverse minds, we need to accept all of neurodivergent people. Actually, by putting in supports, by putting in the um, strategies of all these things, we can equip people to be able to spend their mental energy doing the wonderful, innovative things that they will absolutely do. So things like training and understanding, what we don't want is that, pe that neurodivergent people end up spending their whole day trying to battle all these other things when actually there is so much wonderful time for leaning into change and innovation and all these all these fantastic things. But people can only do that when they feel safe and supported. A sense of community and identity is really, really essential to lean into your neurotype rather than think, oh my goodness, this is a, per this is a personal flaw. Knowing that actually I'm not a broken neurotypical person. I'm a perfect neurodivergent person and I can work in that way. We want to make sure, like you were saying, recruiting from this fantastic neurodiverse talent pool, which we know can often have some barriers um, for fantastic neurodiverse people. Actually, the social dance of an interview, none of us love the social dance of an interview, let alone if you then throw in all these extra things that we might be looking at. And thinking ultimately, I hear time and time again that neurodiverse people will change the world. Essentially, We've just got to let them um, through innovation and breakthrough and challenging the status quo. And as organisations, we want to create the space and embrace that into our organisations. Um, essentially, we're a global technology company and we specialise in accessibility tools and we've been around for 26 years. Now, at TechSelf, we love data. <laughs> so, if anyone's familiar, there was, a, there was a report by Accenture in 2020 and it was called Enabling Change. 
So the key areas that come out of the report uh, that, we can, that we can look at and talk about assisted technology is, I think it's a given that 20% of the population are neurodivergent, okay? Maybe higher, because obviously there's, you know, it could be un undisclosed. But what the report said was, out of, in the workplace, on average, 76% of employees in the workplace did not feel comfortable fully disclosing their condition and disability. Now, that's a huge community that's not being supported, that essentially DNI teams don't know about. So if we look at that, 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 that pool of people, what we, what we do know again from research is that 51% will consider quitting their job or have already decided they're going to quit their job. Now, for a business, then we're talking about you know, huge recruitment costs as well. In terms of the benefits, so more, so more data, so be the business benefits of employing neurodivergent employees in the workplace. Okay. So we know um, from reports that you get 20% higher revenue um, when you in, in basically recruit neurodivergent teams, but you need to support them correctly as well. We've got 76% job seekers believe a diverse workforce is non-negotiable. It's fair to say. I think with my 18 year old daughter. Um, neurodivergent teams, so neurodiverse teams are 87 87% 87, better at making decisions. And then finally, again, neurodiverse teams are more likely to catch up new markets by 70%. So I think that's a good argument to. Uh, recruit and have provisions in place for a neurodiverse workforce. So when we talk about assistive technology, okay, for, for an organisation, when they, you know, we, we see this, you, know, you either get it or you don't get it. When an organisation gets it, okay, and they go totally neuro, you know, fully neuro-inclusive, they put the adoption in place, the internal marketing, they train champions, they, they, they make it, you know, they might build a policy around neurodiversity as well, okay, and, and list all these sort of things as well. But for business, then we're talking about increased productivity. We are talking about retaining talent, to the talent word again. A reduction in recruitment costs. If you're looking to attract new talent, this can help. But what you're, more, what you're doing really when you're going neuroinclusive, you're removing the barriers. So your neurodiverse workforce can come to work as themselves and get their full and their full potential. In our eyes, this is what's missing in the workplace. We're getting there. There's more talk about support for neuro, um, uh, neurodiverse, neurodiverse uh, employees, but we've got a long way to go in, in, in the workplace. So how do we do it? So if an, if an organization wants to be neuro-inclusive, okay, we need to look at universal design. When we're thinking about this, whether it's free tools or paid tools, we need to think of everybody that you can, that you can benefit. Larger companies seem to have software catalogs. So they have the technology sitting in the catalog, again, going back to the adoption, internal marketing, and then the employee can then just pick a button and they've got they've got tools. Okay. Small organizations might not have a software cast up, they might not have a dedicated IT team. So therefore install the files on everybody's machine. It doesn't take long. It, you know, within with technology today, you know, uh, you know, if we look at Microsoft, so MSI technology, we can just push the files to everybody's uh, PC, laptop, and it's very, very quick. So we talked about internal marketing, simple to install and champions. So case studies. So, so two, so two, two organisations in my eyes that get it, they're our clients, okay, is PwC and KPMG. Obviously they're a large organisation, so they, they, they've got an application uh, uh, IT team. So they have, our, they have our software, but not just our software, other tools in their, effectively in their catalogue that every, again, everybody can use. They've got trained champions, um, but 
thing about all this as well is that nobody needs to disclose their condition. And that's the benefit, that's the beauty of being neuro-inclusive. We, we go one step further at TechTel. So we, we, we promote new, being to be neuro-inclusive with assistive technology. When a business is on board with us and they, and they, and they agree and we build that partnership, we then, we then say, right, okay, our software then, you can use it at home. So if you've got children that are neuro, neurodivergent or your partner or your you know, husband or wife, you can use our software at home as well. So we're, we're, we're pushing it, we're pushing it out. And I think that's a, that's a good that's a good thing to do, I think, in today's, um, today's world. So I've made a note of, of a, a few assistive technology that's available. Okay. The Microsoft Accessibility Tools is free within uh, within uh, Office. Okay. They're good tools. Okay. Um, Dragon Dictation. Is, is, is a good um, uh, dictation tool as well that, that seems to be used uh, quite often. In terms of our technology, we've got a toolbar, it's got 25 features. But the features that we see the most used um, when we look at when we look at usage, okay, um, is uh, text to speech, speech to text, obviously for dictation, um, our basic grammar tools, but our home phone word checker. Is incredibly popular. Now we hear all the time. Um, so if somebody's dyslexic, they may have trouble with, you know, I'll give you an example. So it was, it was probably it was the beginning of the year. I was on a call with a, with an analyst at an insurance company actually, and he turned around and said to me, he said, I can't get the word leak correct. He said, when I look at it on, on the screen. It looks correct whether I'm writing M-A-A-T or M-W-E-T. Whatever context, it looks correct, but it's not. It's completely the opposite round. Okay. Our home phone, basically, home phone word checker will, 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 will highlight this and, and basically make those words. That's quite unique to, to what we do. Um, screen masking. So screen masking can benefit. Everybody. This is where we get in the, the, the realms of universal design. So, if anyone's familiar with, with screen masking, if you tint your screen, okay, uh, pale green, pale blue, pale yellow, whatever colour suits you, can make a world of difference. If someone's dyslexic, um, okay. So, I mean, I know it's first hand from, from, from a friend of mine. When they, look at, when they look at the screen and they're reading the document, sometimes the words, they're dancing around, they're moving. That's incredibly near or impossible to consume and to understand that content. If you tint your screen a certain colour and play around with the, uh, the RGB, red, green, blue colour, that could then neutralise that screen and then you could be able to read that screen and consume and understand that, uh, what, what's uh, yeah, all the content. Um, okay, so finally, IT security. In the large organisations, this is so common, okay, because the, uh, okay, you, the DNI team or the assessors or the HR team, okay, they go out to the marketplace and they look at different technology, assisted technology, and they go, we found one. We, we, we found one for this individual. IT get their hands on it. And they turn around and say, it doesn't tip boxes. Um, it's a cloud-based technology. It stores data. Uh, a lot of technologies need to store data and capture data to learn and, and, and to develop the tools. We, we realised this many years ago, and 80% of our technology can be used offline. So it ticks the boxes of the security company. Uh, MOD is a big client of ours as well. But I think that what I'm trying to say is that if you're in a situation, there are options out there because sometimes the, 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 the application security teams, they don't do enough uh, enough checks. So, uh, um, yeah, it's pretty much the present time, aren't they? Okay. If I go past the hour, um, perfect. 20 minutes with each one of us. Uh, breakout sessions, same goes online. We have some amazing facilitators slash moderators. 
to who I'd like to offer my absolute thanks um, for the job they're doing. And once we finish the, 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 the discussion, we're coming back here to summarize. If you have any kind of questions, by all means, otherwise, we'll be outside to network. Thank you very much, and I'll see you back here. For those of you who stay here with the Minister of Science, with Amy, you are great. He makes exactly the right thing. Yeah, so if everyone on this side wants to head with FEMA and greeting presentations. Ah. Um, the room's just out there. Um, if you want to leave that, then Um, everybody watching at home, I've just put on the screen, there's lots of different ways you can get into uh, the virtual rooms, there's a Teams link in the Q&A section, I'll see you there, so if you just jump on that. That will take you to it. Um, also, scan the QR code as well. So, if you're having trouble with the team space that's in the QA and C band, just scan the QR code that's on your screen now and you can take it there. Okay. Uh, what we'll likely do is if um, MMG that are watching, if you're able to put um, the room on to mute now, obviously we can have our discussion and you can all have your discussions. I can see people jumping in virtually, which is great. So, yeah, please follow the instructions on the screen. Um, and in the room, we're going to start ours and Florence so will be uh, leading that with Amy. So. Lovely. So, um, basically, what we want to do is have plenty of conversation and we want to think about innovation. How do we incorporate and um, really celebrate and build on? utilising the wonders of neurodivergent minds within our organisations to facilitate change and to help wonderful things happen. So, what we would love you to do is, if people are quite happy to speak either within yourselves, as a group, if anyone has any ideas that we can start to pull together. So one of the things I'll start um, before I uh, expect anyone to come and have this conversation. So I would say one of the key things for me is all about, like I said, I did have on about it already, um, but about creating spaces, and it's kind of what Darren was saying as well, creating spaces for everybody so that if people feel safe to disclose these things that they might need some support with, or actually if that's not there yet, if that sort of safety and security within that organisation isn't quite there yet, supporting people across the board. Because all of these strategies, all these things we might be looking at, they don't harm anyone. If, if we put them in place for everybody, for most people, they're helpful in some form. They might be particularly essential for some people, but for everybody, they're going to help. So actually, doing that across the board is a really great way to make sure that everybody gets um, gets that support for things they need, so they have that space to do the innovation and drive things forward. So, does anyone have any thoughts? Anything we want to chat through? Any questions that we can have a think about? I think it's really important to ask people Absolutely. to get them involved. So I'm neurodiversion and dyspraxic, um, and I, 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 I really appreciate it when people take that into consideration. Absolutely. Um, and I don't think it's just about asking people in your organisation. It has to start a recruitment process as well, yeah. and with the people coming into your organisation as well. Um, and, and that's really actually because most organisations, what they do is they create policies that don't actually involve the people yeah. that they're trying to help yes. and trying to assist and bring it. You want to change that mindset and ask, anonymise it. If yeah. people aren't comfortable, if people are comfortable, such as myself, I'm happy to talk yeah. about it. Fantastic, absolutely. And like you say, the 
each person will have their own individual strengths and challenges. Like all of these, um, all of these boxes of these particular neurotypes, like for instance, they were created by people, they're not infallible. Each individual person will have their own experience of um, that neurotype might have sort of be neurodivergent, say whatever flavor, we we'll say if you're neurodivergent in one sense, we know you like to be neurodivergent in another sense. Listening to that individual person in that in that individual setting is really important and essential, isn't it? And say one of the things I often do is when I'm having sort of when I'm working with my chest work, I say, I can smack out a big long report, fantastic, not a problem. And normally I will I will say to people, if I've forgotten to send something, please don't recognize, please just email me, because nine times out of ten, I've done it. What I've forgotten to do is send an email that says that I've done it. Um, so having those conversations with people day to day, you know, actually that can just make life a little bit easier. Um, so someone's not panicking, someone's not saying, oh goodness, I'm gonna offend, I don't want to chase somebody, and someone's not going, Oh, yeah, I, did, but I, I know I've completed that. Oh, I've just missed that little tick box. Um, so cre like I say creating those spaces is, is really key and really important um, because we know that you can't just pick up, right, here is the list of um, strategies for an autistic person. Here is the list of strategies for someone who is an ADHD. It, it doesn't work like that. So applying that individually to people and being able to have that conversation as part of creating your inclusive spaces that people feel happy and safe to divulge this, this information without fear of retribution, without fear of it negatively impacting them as well. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Kind of a follow on from that a little bit as well. How do you think organisations can help to create the various different avenues for communication? Yes. Because I think there's a little bit of a risk with some companies just trying it in one way and saying, right, let, let's let's talk about this. Let's be more, more sort yeah. of neurodivergent and then only asking for vocal feedback yeah. and then going, why is nobody talking? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I would say the key thing would be listening to neurodivergent people within your organisation, because actually having those communities, having those spaces to look at, and they will be the best people to say in your particular organisation, actually, yes, let's do some verbal, let's get some written, let's get that variety and where that's most appropriate, um, because they will be on the ground with people, they are people there needing that information day to day. So tapping into those sort of brilliant talent pools within your organisation and backing that up as well, because for some people it might be written, for some people it might be verbal. You know what, can we have both? Can we say let's do this verbally and follow it up with an email so that actually one thing that's coming in through two senses and it's much easier to remember in terms of working memory and things like that. So um, I would say, yeah, tapping into the talent you've already got and listening to what that applies for for a particular organisation. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, um, I'll saw you first, but then I'll come, come down here if that's all right. Um, I think as well, there's not really an understanding in terms of the wider work of those that these aren't disabilities. Yeah. And so oftentimes, you go and ask for something, or the time I managed, um, you kind of ask for something, you ask for what is a reasonable adjustment in your mind, and it will be a bit, it won't be a no, yeah. but there'll be a kind of, well, yes, a, a why. Yeah. And is that really reasonable? Yes. Without the consideration of, there is people back to what you're asking for, but it may not be fully understood how you would experience it when they ask you whether like, neurodivergent can't I <laughs> <laughs> say, for that, I have no other answer that it absolutely is covered under the Equality Act, and we're absolutely looking at things in terms of the disability. And I often like to think of the social model of disability that actually we are disabled by our environment, and if there if the spaces and the communities around us um, are not if we're not able to work in our neurotype, that is disabling in itself. Um, and I think understanding the key reasons of the NHG is one of the key ones that's seen as a bit of a moral failing, and people don't actually often understand the biochemical differences that we know exist. Um, and so, as I do my trainings, that's often something we chat through, and 
when you actually explain the processes, people go, oh yes, that's why task initiation is something that's a real challenge or maintaining motivation over time. When we know there's biochemical supports to that, um, it's really, really helpful versus a lot of the media, a lot of the general societal view seem to see these things as moral failings and we absolutely know they're not. So things like Fully understanding that core basis is so is so essential, isn't it? It's one of the reasons I say, obviously I'm really passionate about training, that's what I do, that's one of the core reasons I really believe that. Because then otherwise people don't do it as a right, okay, we've got to hit the box. It's a no, I absolutely understand why this little key bit is important. Not all right, you've asked for it, so we'll do it. Want to embrace that across across time, absolutely. Wonderful. So that's that's sort of match what you're thinking. Awesome, thank you. I'll pop down here if that's right. Yeah, um, kind of building on that, I think you know, it's talk about having an inclusive space for all um, and sort of not cherry picking certain universities. So, like autism, for example, could have a very specific views from an employer's point yes. of view. But say something like ADHD or OCD, where it could sort of be seen as an immediate hindrance to productivity, like how can you include? such a specific group, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely, because we know that there are specific strengths across the different neurotypes. But again, when we're thinking about um, the information that we're getting from the media and things like that, we tend to often see neuroemergence as this superpower or it's the worst thing that could ever happen. And because life doesn't really work like that. We live somewhere in the middle. There are absolutely barriers that are in place, but there are fantastic parts of neurodivergent minds as well. And we know across the board, there are really fantastic strengths of neurodivergent individuals. We just tend to, we hear more of, say, for autistic people, you have your, if you think about your media, your shell, the big bang theory, your brain balance, based on the new generation, whatever it might be. But that that sort of savant idea that we tend to get sold by the media is isn't reflective of the whole of the population because that's one really narrow view of what autism is in the same way that the seven-year-old boy found in the classroom it's a real really narrow idea of what ADHD is someone puts to take the lights on and off is a really narrow idea of OCD so actually fully understanding those differences, absolutely the barriers that could be in place for companies <coughs> and particularly for individuals. But there are also a whole host of wonderful strengths of neurodivergent minds that people don't hear from the media, that actually if we can get that full idea of people's brains, then there are still wonderful parts into that. Um, and again, particularly for say ADHD, it's one of those things like I say, tends to get a little bit more seen as a moral failing and they just make a spreadsheet, make a spreadsheet. I've made so many spreadsheets in my life and when they work, I'm a, you know what, I'm going to create a more colour coded spreadsheet and that's going to be the key thing that's going to work for me. And for me, it was understanding that because of my working memory, the moment that goes into a folder, the moment I save it, close that spreadsheet. I've, I've lost, basically. It was pinning emails in an inbox. Um, something really, really simple, really, really little. But that was the key difference. And for an organisation, if they're not understanding, actually there's key differences why a list might not work, but that does. They're only going to lean into those, those more challenging sides of it. Go, well, it's a challenge because we can't solve it. It's a thing that can't be solved, but actually we lean into the knowledge of why these things work the way they do, then we can absolutely lean into those things in that same way. So that kind of, sort of address what you're, what you're thinking. Yes, thank you. Yeah, also. Fabulous. Oh, yes. Um, I think, sorry, in the order of being diagnosed, left hand is dyslexic, dyspraxic, ADHD, autistic spectrum. <laughs> But they're not all diagnosed, but they're all there anyway. Um, I think the most important thing is for employers to get their neurodiverse employees, insofar as they're open about it, to look at policies and training around neurodiversity. Absolutely. Because I've seen some shocking things in training, yeah. including, I think, my favourite, Jim suffers with dyslexia. 
I mean, sorry, where, where would you say Carmela Harris suffers with blackness? Yeah. You know, the, the language could be appalling. And this is a training video aiming to introduce non-neurodiverse people to neurodiversity. That's pretty shocking. Um, and I think asking people how they like to describe in the way that you would with an LGBT plus group, with a race and ethnicity group, I think it's really important to use the terminology, not that just is current, but that your employees are comfortable with. Because, you know, I mean, personally, I hate the term Asperger's, but some people might like that or find it easier to deal with. I hopefully, I mean, I'm, I find that quite, quite morally unacceptable, but you know, it's it, it, it's a spread. And it's, I think it's really important to get the views off the people if you can. I think the other thing that helps in an organisation is having, you know, if you've got some senior people really persuading them to be open Absolutely. about about their issues because it just makes it easier for everybody else to see somebody who's successful in the business. Absolutely, those role models are really key because we know, say, say in eight years, we know tend to really thrive in leadership positions and that community and identity is really key and we know people don't into these neat little boxes, all of these boxes were created by people, but the personal understanding and identity of each of those things is really essential. I so say, even in my sort of clinical NHS work, the, the shift has really been noticeable from this really medical view of these are disorders all the way through. These are a core part of people's identity. This is part of who people are and learning to work in that best way. Absolutely, like you say, it's really essential. It comes with the language, and things like things like language can be really powerful in terms of do we see someone's neurodivergence as a core cool part of who they are and part of why they are brilliant and why these things might be challenging, but why they are fantastic in so many ways, or is it like you say, this is a thing someone saddles or suffers with? It's in that that can really have a dramatic impact to if somebody feels safe to um, to disclose that they are neurodivergent. Actually, if all the language you hear says, well, oh, it's a, this terrible thing and suffers with it, that's not going to make someone feel confident and safe to say, actually, that's me. Whereas if we can lean into that whole um, identity first um, perspective that's that's really really important for for everybody's well-being and listening like you say to neurodiverse people and what actually are the problems rather than someone coming in and saying well these are the things we need to solve actually neurodiverse people say well no, these are the things we want to address in the workplace these are the things that we need to follow through with amazing oh yes um, I'm just wondering, um, I, I thought your quote was really interesting in having to sort of almost like battle for reasonable adjustments. And I was wondering to sort of use your analogy of the cactus. I was wondering if there are any good examples of environments that are inclusive by design because they've got the greenhouse and maybe they've got like a rockery for the alpine club. So you don't have to fight to get those things and you can just flourish without it being sort of <laughs> like a or beyond the law. My, I mean, my prime example I would use is myself at Adjust. So, um, so boss of the Zero Diversion and has set up a company that thrives for us. Actually, we have an assistant that does a lot of with and we can come and do the things that we love to do not good at doing. Um, and like Diane was saying, having the textbook available, just there to be able to tap into, because so many times, I mean, I don't think I went to nine to 12 months for my access to work to have to come through. It's incredibly frustrating knowing you have things that could really help you, but having to go through policies and being into those things as we have every day as well as that. But people like GCHQ actually knowing that in the way we work, that that's built in and it's simple and it's those tiny little shifts and that approach and that understanding more than necessarily there's a particular task force, there's this, there's that. Yeah. It's those underlying um, aspects of things running through and things primarily. What, what you raised there is all about culture. 
is creating that culture yeah. of openness, of vulnerability, Absolutely. fostering that right environment to enable all people, not just the neurodiverse, to thrive. And when you do that, when you change organisations, you make them more profitable and you have happier, better lives yes. fundamentally. Well, I think we don't like to be marginalised again. So no. we don't want to get suddenly to have an answer or workplace, it's just you the better thing. It defines the purpose, right? So exactly. absolutely, it's the osmosis and the cross pollination. Absolutely. Best friends and more coming. Where did I come? Three for once. Too many wins today. I don't know. Friday. I should have been on separate.
and looking at how you can include a specific group um, because each type has their own strengths. Um, some are seen, and they should be seen as a superpower, but sometimes can be seen as negative. And um, but understanding that there are fantastic strengths across all uh, neurodivergent positions across the board. And not falling into the trap of um, the uh, stereotypes that the media can perpetuate as well, such as, you know, Rain Man and what kind of stuff. Um, also, employers need to look at policies. Um, and training on neurodiversity. Um, asking a neurodiversity person how they would like to be described. And if you have somebody who's senior in your organisation, getting them to be visible, um, it helps others feel more comfortable and, that, and helps others have that conversation and create, again, as I said before, those safe spaces. Um, and lastly, um, we want to know some good examples of a, a, of a good environment, adjust services, text help, Again, uh, GCHQ are all examples of that, and they help to create a culture um, and an environment and they think all to thrive. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. And yeah. uh, Darren, I know that we had the last know. one, but I'm aware that it's now yeah. past 10 o'clock and they are going to cut us off. So, so massive, yeah. Yeah, massive thank you to everyone. I really appreciate everyone in the room. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for joining. And thanks everyone for watching. <laughs>